Hello, my name is Andrew and welcome to my kitchen. In this video, you're going to see me cook 10 pounds of citrus. This is part of an ongoing series on the channel where I cook a large amount of one type of ingredient over the course of many recipes, most of which I've never made before, in an effort to better understand the things that I'm cooking with. And today it's citrus. There are many different types of citrus, like this Buddha's hand, for example, which I didn't find an exact recipe for, but I thought it was too cool looking to pass up. I think you actually just eat it by... <laughs> oh my God. Regardless of what I talk about for the rest of this video, this is one of the tastiest things featured across the whole thing. Citrus is a great category of produce. It's often very delicious with oranges, grapefruits, but it's also very assertive with limes and lemons and sour, acidic applications. But I find myself often adding it to recipes when it's called for and not really thinking about what exactly it's contributing or how using a different variety might alter the contribution in a given dish. I've cooked all these recipes already, and now I'm gonna take you through how those experiences went. So the first recipe I made was for a Negroni, which is a cocktail. This is the first time I've been able to do a drink in this series. For the Negroni, I'm starting with some chunky ice cubes and then equal parts gin, sweet vermouth, and Campari. And then for the citrus, I have this navel orange, which I'm gonna take a generous slice of out of the center. The Negroni is a classic Italian aperitivo. So it's a cocktail you're meant to have before dinner because it sparks your appetite. It has this bitter flavor. The orange contributes to that. It's very delicious, which also makes it the perfect thing to have at the start of this video. Also the most fantastic color. The next dish I made was a simple savory citrus salad. So I started by processing the other ingredients that were gonna accompany the citrus, which was red onion, which I sliced thinly and put into an ice water bath to remove some of the harshness that usually comes with raw onion. Then there was also some thinly sliced fennel and some thinly sliced celery. For the citrus, I started with a caracara orange, which I removed the skin and all of the white pith from, and then sliced thinly into little medallions. There was also a blood orange and a star ruby grapefruit. The blood orange in particular is a very striking piece of citrus. This one was kind of marbled throughout so that one side was closer to the normal orange color of orange and the other one was this deep blood red. And when I had all of the skin removed and I had just the flesh of the inside, from far away you could mistake it for like a thick filet mignon. And then I made a basic vinaigrette of olive oil, champagne wine vinegar, and salt, which I shook vigorously in a container to combine. This is a dish I really wanted to make because citrus is, I think, most often consumed in sweet things. Or at the very least, you eat an orange or a grapefruit in their raw form as a sort of sweet thing. And this salad is very interesting to me because it is taking that raw citrus flavor and applying the least amount of savory stuff to then turn it into something savory, if that makes sense. So you're still enjoying this raw citrus flavor, but then you have, oh, this pepperiness of the olive oil and the other acidity of the vinegar, the fennel and celery, which have this sort of anise flavor. And together with the orange, tastes a lot like the Negroni, which with the vermouth and Campari also have a lot of that sort of botanical bitter flavor to it. The next recipe I made was carne asada. And I referenced a recipe from Chef Roy Choi's book, LA Sun. So it's not the most traditional recipe, but his carne asada is very well known in Los Angeles. So for this dish, it really all centers around the marinade. So I began by zesting lime and orange into the jug of my blender and then juicing both fruits, and then adding a whole host of other ingredients, including a kiwi fruit, jalapenos, cilantro, garlic, onion, green onion, ancho chili powder, some sugar, salt, of course, as well as some beer and mirin. 
And then that all goes into a bag with the flap steak that I was using for this recipe. So I let that marinate for 24 hours and then I grilled it outside on my charcoal grill. There is quite a bit of sugar in this dish, so the edges are going to caramelize pretty rapidly. That's something that got away from me in a few places, but overall it turned out super good. I let it rest for a moment and then chopped it up into the usual size that I associate with carne asada. Overall, super delicious. There's a tremendous amount of sweet citrus flavor imparted into the meat. And like many recipes that I'm gonna cover in this video, citrus is playing a very active role in the transformation of this meat beyond just the addition of its flavor. The acid is helping to preserve and tenderize the meat and transform it into something that it wouldn't be without the presence of this acid. The next recipe I tried was for a martini. And for this martini, I wanted to do it with a simple lemon twist. And what I really wanted to do was get that very thin twist of lemon, which I've tried to do before at home, but never super successfully. And I know that there are specialized tools to do this, but I don't have them. And I also like to sort of force my way into learning how to do something without the correct tool. So I took a thin slice of lemon and then cut it almost in half, but keeping together the flesh on the other side and then carefully pared away the yellow flesh from the white pith and inside of the slice. And then beyond that, it was a very simple gin martini with dry vermouth. I had a chilled glass. I stirred my gin and vermouth in a second glass full of ice, and then carefully coiled that zest into as tight of a roll as I could, plopped it in the glass, and that was it. I really like martinis. With a twist is usually my preference. I don't think it was perfect, but I was pretty pleased with how it came out appearance-wise at the end. There are lots of ways to make a martini, but I think it's great with a twist because it only takes the bare minimum of this essence of lemon to be imparted into this otherwise very simple cocktail. I really enjoy it. The next dish I made was avgo lemono the Greek chicken lemony soup. So I began by boiling a chicken with some very basic broth components of carrot, celery, onion, some bay leaf, and just water. Let that come to a boil, boil it for 45 minutes. Once the chicken's done, I remove it from the stock, and then I'll strain all of that liquid, removing the vegetables and aromatics. I'll then return that to a boil, and then add a cup of arborio rice. While that's cooking, I pull apart the meat of the chicken, usually cutting away the white meat to save for a different purpose, since it tends to get kind of dry in a soup. The rice needs to cook until it's almost at the breaking part, so it's starting to release a lot of its starch into the broth, which is gonna serve to thicken it later. I'll then take it off the heat and bring it over to a bowl where I've combined eggs and the juice of several lemons. I whisk those to combine, and then I'm slowly adding the hot broth of the soup to those lemon and eggs so that they're being tempered and not cooked. Don't wanna end up with scrambled egg soup. Once they've been brought up to temperature, that whole mixture goes back into the soup, which is serving to flavor and additionally thicken it. At that point, I check for seasoning and return the chicken meat to the soup. And that's pretty much it. There are a number of variations on this recipe. You could add more vegetables, but this is sort of the simplest permutation with just the thickened stock, the chicken, and this lemon flavor, which has been imparted throughout the whole soup. Whenever I make it, I find it surprising how suddenly lemony it is, but that will sort of taper off as the soup sits and matures, and that initial really bright lemon flavor fades a little bit. I always find it so delicious when you have a warm, comforting bowl of something that also has citrus flavor. Because a lot of the time I associate citrus with fresh, cold, bright, that type of flavor group. But to have it with a warm bowl of soup is also so delicious. The next dish I made was a dessert called lemon posset. And for this dish, I referenced a recipe from the chef Claire Clark. This is a dish I actually first came across by seeing Jacques Pepin talk about it on Rachel Ray's show. And he was discussing Clark's work at the French Laundry where she was well known for making this dish. So I began by zesting Meyer lemon into a pot. This is actually a Meyer lemon. And Meyer lemons are often used in desserts, I think because they tend to have less acidity and more of a gentle lemon flavor. Into that pot with the zest goes heavy cream. And then into a second pot, I juiced the lemons 
and then added some plain sugar. I then brought both pots onto the stove and heated them through. Clark mentions that reducing the lemon juice can help make a thicker set to the final dish, although it's not totally necessary. I was whisking the lemon juice to fully combine the sugar. There might have been some reduction that took place, but when both were heated, I combined both, and that's essentially it. That mixture then gets poured into the final dishes that they're gonna be served in. In my case, I had these small glass ramekins, and into half of them, I've added some blueberries, which is something I saw Jacques Pepin do and seemed like a good idea. So then these go into the refrigerator and set overnight. It's kind of amazing that just a little bit of juice and cream created this complete dessert. The flavor was really good. I mean, you're basically eating heavy cream that has coagulated. And it has this gentle, aromatic, lemony essence to it. Really simple, but really delicious. And again, this is another recipe where the juice of the citrus is playing not just a flavor role, but it is doing the job of creating the final dish. This is definitely a dish that punches way above its weight in effort of creation. The next recipe I made was for a caipirinha, the Brazilian cocktail of cachaça and lime. So I began by cutting up my limes. I split them in half and then cut away the center core pith that was in each one, and then split those halves in half again, which I then muddled in a glass with sugar. By the way, if you didn't notice, I'm going in order of citruses, so we've now moved on to the lime portion of the video. I then add cachaça, which is this spirit that is made from sugar cane, and a bunch of crushed ice. Stir that together, and that's the most basic caipirinha. It's really good. Cachaça has sort of a vanilla flavor to my taste, and with the lime, it has kind of this new funky acid sweet flavor that's really so close in construction to a margarita, but it tastes so different and is really delicious in its own unique way. I really like the caipirinha. The next two dishes are going to be preparations of raw seafood. The first of which is agua chile. This is a dish I actually first had filming the show Worth It, and I'm referencing what I learned interviewing the chef Gilberto Cetina at his restaurant Holbosch. I began by slicing my sea scallops into thin, slices, about thirds for the size of scallop I had, and then also having some shrimp. And then I made the agua chile. So in a container, I had lime juice, a little bit of cucumber, serrano chili, cilantro, salt, and water. I then blended that all together and added a little bit more water as the consistency needed it and for what I thought the balance of flavor needed. And then I simply dressed the seafood with that agua chile. Remembering how I ate it at Holbush, I also cut up some avocado to serve on the side, and then simply plated the seafood into a dish, covering it with that remaining aguachile. And you can actually see the acid from the limes has cooked the exterior of the shrimp a little bit, where it's turning that orange color that naturally occurs when shrimp is cooked. I remember tasting the aguachile first and thinking, I'm not sure I got this totally right, but when I finally tasted it with that scallop, the scallop being so sweet and meaty, the aguachile suddenly clicked and I was like, oh my gosh, this is it. Well, I don't think I did that good of a job, but suddenly the combination of flavors really made sense. This is really delicious. It's very acidic, it's quite spicy with that serrano chili, and overall it has a very green flavor to it. It's funny how that happens when everything is green, you think, wow, this really tastes green. <laughs> the next dish I made was leche de tigre. And I referenced the recipe from the chef Ricardo Zarate in his book, The Fire of Peru. So much like agua chile, leche de tigre refers to what the raw fish is going to be dressed in. So for this recipe, I actually begin by trimming some of my fish. I have this white flesh corvina, I'm gonna take a little bit of the trimmings of that fish and add it to the blender. I'm then also adding garlic, ginger, the tender ends of celery along with their leaves, the heart of red onion, and aji amarillo, which is this Peruvian yellow pepper paste. Ricardo specifies that you wanna use the heart of the onion for this portion of the marinade since it tends to have a stronger, more assertive flavor and the outside layers of the red onion will be saved for finishing the dish later. I then juice several limes, and as I begin to blend, I add the lime juice. As it gets going, I'm also adding some ice cubes, 
Since there is raw fish in this marinade, it's best that everything stays nice and cold. Then I'm slicing those outer layers of the red onion very thinly and mixing them in ice water to remove some of the harshness of that onion flavor. I cut the fish into generous chunks. That was the specification of the recipe. And then everything gets combined. In a bowl first, I have my fish, the leche de tigre, then some of those red onions. Everything gets tossed by hand. I also have some cilantro leaves, which I've plucked and refreshed in ice water to make them nice and bright and alive. And that's the dish. It's really quite striking looking. Ricardo Zarate's original recipe actually also has a portion for making fried calamari, which I wasn't gonna go through the trouble of making because I wanted to just focus on the leche de tigre portion of it. But when I was at the fishmonger picking up this Corvina, they happened to also sell fried seafood there. So I got some fried calamari, which I had on the side. And it was a tremendous combination. The leche de tigre was an incredibly powerful flavor. There's quite a bit of spice coming from that aji amarillo, but when you bite into a large chunk of this white flesh fish, which is really mild, it kind of butters out the whole situation and makes it a really pleasant eating experience. Not the kind of dish that I ever expected to be making for myself at home. This is cooking that I really always associate with restaurants, but it's cool to do raw fish and marinate at home. The last recipe I made was an upside down citrus cake. And specifically, I referenced a recipe from Nicole Rucker and her book, Dappled. She mentions that many types of citrus would be suitable for this recipe. So I thought it would be a great opportunity to use a couple of different kinds that we got from the farmer's market. You begin by melting butter and sugar together in a saucepan and pouring that into a prepared cake tin which is going to be ultimately the top of the final cake. That tin then goes into the freezer to set. And meanwhile, I'm processing the citrus. I've got a caracara orange, a blood orange, and Meyer lemon, which I thought would contrast nicely with the really sweet oranges. And this fruit is going on flesh and all, minus the seeds, which I picked out as best I could. I then prepared the batter, which is standard cake stuff, but this one happens to be olive oil based. And then it was a matter of assembling the cake. I pulled out the frozen tin and started arranging the citrus. I tried to space the lemon sort of distributed between lots of the oranges since I thought the more sour taste of the lemon would contrast the other oranges nicely. And once I had a nice overlapping layer, I poured in the batter and off to the oven it went. So that's the upside down cake. I let it to cool briefly, and then I inverted it onto a plate. In hindsight, I actually could have overlapped the fruit more aggressively because in that butter and sugar mixture bubbling at the bottom of the pan, they sort of shifted around and spread out. And actually, I think the most appealing part was where it sort of curled over the edge of the cake to the side. The effect is really pretty gorgeous. You get this kind of jewel-like top to the cake. I think I actually may have done too much batter for my size tin because I think the proportion of cake to top was a little off in my execution. But overall, it was super delicious. It has almost like a pound cake taste to it. It's exciting to have the citrus front and center right on the top of the cake and show it off in all its splendor. And really, it's doing the most for the flavor of this dish. So that's how I cooked 10 pounds of citrus. I hope you enjoyed watching. If you have suggestions for ingredients I should do in the future, please let me know. But anyway, thank you for watching. Also, here's a kumquat. That didn't show up in the video at all. The outside is sweet and the inside is sour.